Welcome to La Follette United Methodist Church on this beautiful Sunday morning, 72 hours without significant precipitation now. But you do remember back in 2016 when we were praying for rain during the wildfires, don't you? Sometimes this gets to be kind of situational. A few announcements. Uh, it's three days until Ash Wednesday, and we are having Ash Wednesday services. Uh, here at church, Wednesday at 12 p.m. Uh, you are hereby notified and asked to invite those in the community, your friends and neighbors, to uh, come and join us. It is 25 days until spring, according to the groundhog and the calendar. And for those of you who are really, really into planning, it's 306 days till Christmas. A few announcements. Um, men's, again, Ash Wednesday service, Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Men's breakfast will be Saturday at 8. And this is in your bulletin. Now, these things will not be on the screen today because we are, as they say in the media, experiencing technical difficulties. Okay? And hopefully, uh, in the near future, we will have it back on the screen, but... Like me, you'll have to dig out your glasses and do everything by uh, manual print mode today. The upper room, speaking of glasses, the upper room, the new ones are available uh, in the narthex as you come in. Do we have other announcements? Ms. Fern. Yes, we do. We have the community meal coming up on Tuesday, and we have a few empty spaces on the sheets out there by the door we you go into the office that we can use help with if anyone can sign up for that. Beyond that, I think that's probably it. Community meeting. Important ministry. Other announcements? Happenings? None? Okay. Our call to worship uh, today in your hymnal, page 371, I stand amazed in the presence. Please stand as we sing this.
turn to page 888 for our affirmation from 1st Corinthians page 888 this is the good news which we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved Christ died for our sins was buried was raised on the third day and appeared first in the women then to Peter in the twelve and then to be faithful witnesses we believe Jesus is the Christ the anointed one of God firstborn of all creation the firstborn from the dead in whom all things hold together in whom the Lord of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit Christ is the head of the church the church and the Lord of the cross reconciles all things to God Amen seated. At this time, we'll continue to worship with our praises and prayer concerns. Uh, what praises or prayer concerns do we have this morning? Yes, Miranda. And I'd like to pray for my father, Mark Hoskins, and Kirk Owens, uh, Kirk Owens, and Kirk Owens, and Kirk Owens, and And remember all those that are um, going through treatment related to cancer or uh, whether it's radiation or chemo. Other uh, praises or prayer concerns. Yes. Okay. Pam. and a good friend. Okay. Other uh, praises, prayer concerns. Lisa? Is it praise to see Betty here today? Yes, Miss Betty's here. It's a praise. Roger? My sister, she's been in she's having brain surgery this morning. Okay. Sister's having surgery. Miss Miranda? Um, they're just going through a rough time today, remembering him. Okay. Others? Yes, Jill. Okay, co-workers. Yes. Mike, yes. Uh, Chauncey, McCormick, and Mike. Thank you, Laura. Others? Yes, Paul. Joe Martin and Charlie Riggs. Joe and Charlie. Very good. Anniversary 51. Good job, Fern. You've done well. <laughs> yeah. uh, was there another praise or prayer concern over this way? Yes, Betty. This is a praise or a prayer concern, but Mike and I were married 60 years last night. Right? <laughs> that could be both. Betty, you've done a fantastic job. (laughs) 
Do we have any unspoken concerns this morning? All righty. At this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, for the, for the opportunity to gather into this space every Sunday, um, to gather our, our thoughts, our feelings, our attitude, our disposition, our spirit, all around you and pointed um, in your direction. Lord, we thank you for those that gather weekly to do the same, uh, to join us in this sanctuary, uh, to lift up hearts and minds, to be in one accord. And Lord, as we prepare this Sunday, even uh, for Ash Wednesday, as we, we look at this season of Lent, in preparation of Easter, um, Lord, we ask that your, your, your Spirit, your Holy Spirit, would settle in this space. That uh, you would help us remove and sort of push back um, our chores, the lists of things that we have to do, um, obligations that are on our schedule, um, help us to, to not be distracted uh, during this time. Lord, give, give us sanctuary for one hour so that we may fully and completely worship you uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, as we worship, we bring before you this morning those in need of prayer. We offer up to you those that are traveling. We pray travel mercies upon them. We offer up um, those that are going through uh, treatment or procedures. We offer up neighbors, those in our community, family members, those close to us in whatever burden, trial, maybe even temptation that they are going through, uh, we lift them up to you this morning. Lord, we also bring before you our praises, all the, the different ways that you um, are moving in our lives, all the different uh, ways that we hear your voice, that we see your hand, that we experience your glory and your grace. So, Lord, we thank you for celebrations. Uh, we, we, we thank you for answered prayers. We thank you for guiding us uh, those moments during the week uh, that surprise us when we're surprised by your presence. Lord, help us not to forget those moments or even consider them lightly, but help us to cherish moments that we have with you, to, to cherish uh, those special times when you're moving around or in us that, in a special way. So, Lord, we thank you for uh, answered prayers. We thank you for our praises and we lift them up to you. Lord, we also lift up unspoken concerns and praises. We pray that you would be with all of uh, our unspoken this morning. And we especially lift up those around us and, and their needs and their concerns and maybe their burdens or temptations. We pray for our church. We pray for this congregation, especially through Lent, the ministries that, that we'll be offering, the different ways that folks in, the fa if, uh, folks in the community will get familiar with us, will, uh, different ways that we meet folks and share your love. 
So Lord, we close this prayer being mindful of your son's love and being mindful of the words that he taught us to pray as we join together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll continue our worship service this morning with our choral and uh, ensemble. The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The King is mighty. He loves justice. You have established equity. In Jacob, you have done what is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called on the Lord and he answered them. 
He spoke to them from the pillar of cloud. They kept his statutes and the decrees he gave them. O Lord, our God, you answered them. You were to Israel a forgiving God, though you punished their misdeeds. Exalt the Lord, our God, and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord, our God, is holy. Our next hymn this morning is Be Thou My Vision. It's on page 451. Let's stand for this hymn. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many gifts and blessings that you have given to us. This is our opportunity to give back a little for the upbuilding of your kingdom. We pray this offering in your Son's holy name. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. and you may be seated. Our uh, text this morning, you will either have to listen to or follow along in your own Bibles or perhaps one of the Bibles in the pews. There are not one but two texts this morning. So the first one is Matthew 17, 1 through 9. The second is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 and following. 2 Peter 1, 16 and following. And I'm uh, reading this morning from the New Living Translation.
Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9, reads this way. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up to a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter explained, Lord, it's wonderful that we're here to see this. If you want, I will make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and the voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved Son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And when they had looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16 and following. Peter writes to the church, for we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw His majestic splendor with our own eyes when He received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to Him, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. When we heard that voice from heaven, we were with him on the mountain, that holy mountain. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you guide the reading, hearing, and understanding of this, your holy word. Amen. This morning is Transfiguration Sunday. Um, not too many Christians actually um, maybe consider the significance of this Sunday. Um, and, and it may be because this is not, this doesn't tend to be a very popular text or passage. I mean, Jesus goes up on a mountain, some things happen, a voice from the clouds, and and they come back down the mountain. That's really it. Jesus is very passive uh, in this story, so it tends uh, not to be brought up or it tends to be glossed over. The, the problem is this is a very, very significant passage. There are only two occasions in the Gospels where God, our Heavenly Father, speaks only twice. The first was at Jesus' baptism. We remember this scene. Um, in fact, do we not have a window of the baptism? Where's it at? Uh, this is my beloved son. Which one? is? It must be this one. What's that one over there? Is it that one? All right, it's this one right here. Oh, that's Jesus on the rock, and that, the blue there is the water. And the dove coming down, so that it's this window, it's this scene. Uh, Jesus is being baptized, the Holy Spirit uh, comes down like a dove, and there's a voice from heaven, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased, or in the New Living Translation, who brings me great joy. That's the first time God speaks 
in the Gospels, in the New Testament. This is the second. And there isn't any other times. So, this Sunday, the transfiguration of Jesus, Jesus being transformed on a mountain is a pretty big deal. God must have something He wants us to get. If He's only speaking twice, and this is the other time it happens, then it's a big deal. So what is going on in this story? We covered just a little of it last week. This was uh, part of our longer reading last Sunday, if you'll remember. But this morning we'll slow down just a bit to try to figure out what is going on in, in this scene, in this story. Jesus takes the inner circle, Peter and the brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and um, he takes them away up on a mountain. Now, this isn't new. Jesus uh, had this inner circle. Some of us know what it's like to experience an inner circle, being a part of an inner circle, whether it's at work or with our peers or maybe at home, uh, siblings, we're, we're a part of a, a, a group that mom or dad talks to a little more than the others, but w some of us, most of us, maybe even all of us, know what it's like to be a part of an inner circle. You get just a little more, right? You get a little more knowledge, a little more instruction, just a little more. You're a little closer to what's going on. Well, this is the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. It wasn't odd for them to be separated from the other group, but you have to wonder, if you're not part of the inner circle, what you're thinking. I mean, if you're Matthew, or if you're James the Lesser, what are you thinking, right? There goes Jesus, off with those three again. So those three, there were some dynamics, different dynamics in the disciples themselves. But these three often got a little more. Now, we're not sure how far they traveled. We're not sure how high this mountain is, but it, it was a significant journey, and it was significant height. And you, you have to think, did, was this longer than normal? Was Peter, James, and John thinking, man, we're, we're going high up. The only time this happens, I mean, being Jewish and understanding all the stories in the Old Testament that have to do with climbing a mountain, they had to be thinking, whatever's coming is probably going to be big. Whatever we're about to hear from Jesus, it's going to be big. And so they get to the top, and the New Living Translation says, as they watched... Now, it, it could be that this was similar to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus took the inner circle a little further into the garden and then stopped them and said, Stay here while I go over there. It could be that that's what happened. And Jesus went a little further, and their, their, their instructions in the garden were to watch and be in prayer. Maybe that's what they were doing. But as they watched, Jesus was transformed. The word there literally means, the Greek word literally means changed. And the only way the authors knew how to describe this change was with color. His face was as bright as the sun and his clothes were as white as light, pure light. Well, that's a change. Then they look, and all of a sudden, there's two other folks with them. Now, how they know, Peter, James, and John had never met Moses and Elijah. How they knew that was Moses and Elijah, I don't know. But they're... As they looked at Jesus and watched him be changed right before their eyes, Moses, 
an Old Testament icon representing the law, Elijah, another Old Testament icon representing the prophets, stood and talked with Jesus. Now, we know they had no clue what to do because Peter did a normal, he did a regular Peter, right? He, he did one of his regular things that, that, and we've all been there. We, we've all been sort of in charge of a group, right? Either as a parent um, or maybe on a team, maybe you're a team captain or just the captain or leader of one of your groups and something happens so amazing that it's really up to you to speak. Nobody else is going to say anything. So the, the team captain, the, the group leader, the parent has to say something. And, and if you're like me, what you said was similar to what Peter said. It, it was just, I'm just shooting at the hip here. I have no idea what's going on, but I need to make sure everybody else is sort of on board Boy, Jesus, it's a good thing we're here. Maybe we can make a memorial. And before he could finish his thought, a cloud gathered in. Now, in case you forgot what that cloud or you missed what a cloud gathering in represents, the liturgy for this morning all lines up. If, if you were listening to Laura... If you were in a Sunday school that does a quarterly, every scripture passage on Transfiguration Sunday mentions the cloud. A cloud that gathers. And when a cloud gathers on a mountain, it's the glory of God. So a cloud, just as Peter was talking, this cloud pulls in, a bright cloud... And then there's a voice. This is my beloved Son, who brings me great joy. Listen to Him. And that's almost it. Almost it. Uh, they become so overwhelmed, realizing that the cloud was the glory of God, they did exactly what they were supposed to do. Fall straight down on your face. Cover yourself up because the glory of God is about to settle. So cover yourself up. They covered themselves up. They fell flat on their face to the ground. I don't know what they were saying or doing, if they were doing anything, but they were terrified. Jesus goes over, says, fellows, it's over. Get up. Don't be afraid. Moses, Elijah were gone. It was just Jesus. They begin walking back down the mountain, and as they're walking down, Jesus gives his only instruction of the entire thing, other than don't be afraid. He says, don't tell anybody what you've seen until after the resurrection. Now that's where the scene stops. That moment is over. And... Honestly, they didn't bring it back up. Peter would bring it up later when he wrote his letter. It was so powerful, so profound. It was one of the few things Peter even wrote about. But it made such an impression on him that he wrote about Jesus being transformed on that mountain. So there they are. And their instruction was, don't speak until after Easter. Well, here's the thing. If this story, if this event happened to you and me, if we were a part of the inner circle, imagine being one of the three, Jesus would not give us that instruction. Because we have Easter faith. Our faith is resurrection faith. So He wouldn't say to us, uh, don't share about my glory 
because we already have what he was waiting on. The reason this group, Peter, James, and John, weren't supposed to say anything is because they couldn't connect the dots yet. They didn't have Easter faith. They didn't have resurrection faith. They didn't know how to connect this event with the baptism, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, with the death, and with the resurrection. However, you and I, well, that's different. We have Easter faith. If we were involved in this story today, Jesus would say, when we get down to the bottom of this mountain, Go and tell everyone you can about what you just saw. Because you have Easter faith. So the question becomes for us, on, on the hills of Ash Wednesday, just before Lent begins, are you ready? Are you ready to share the glory of of Jesus with others. I mean, this is an amazing, I guess it's an obligation, it's an amazing opportunity, it's an amazing part of our faith, right? We're on the other side of Easter. We're on the side of Easter where Jesus says, go and make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach folks everything that I've taught you. That's the side of Easter we're on. We're on the side of Easter that the Holy Spirit's been poured out and resides in us, in those who, who have been forgiven and, and who are working through sanctification. We're on that side of the story. So Jesus would say, are you ready to share? Remember the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, verse 14. This is talking about the light, the light that came into, or the Word that became light, but the Word that is Jesus, the living Word. John 1, 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us as of the glory of God. He dwelt among us as the glory of God Himself. Jesus is God's glory. Are you ready to share Jesus with others? Are you ready to listen? The voice in the cloud, God's voice, the second and only other time God spoke in the New Testament, in the Gospels in the New Testament proper, Listen to Him. This is my Son who brings me great joy. Listen to Him. Are we ready to listen to Jesus? To listen to His teachings, to listen to His Word? Now, I know folks who listen to half of part of what Jesus says. They listen to half of part. Now, I don't know what percentage that is, um, but if you catch me on a certain day with a certain topic, you'll find me in that group. I mean, there are things in here that I'd prefer not to talk about, that I'd prefer not to read, that I'd prefer not to have to understand and apply to my life. And I shared a sermon a while back that it, it, was, it was a one in two decade sermon. Um, I don't like talking about those things, even though they're here. So catch me on the right day, and I'm with that group. I listen to part of maybe half of what Jesus is teaching. But that's not the, that wasn't what the Word said, was it? The voice from heaven didn't say, this is my Son who brings me great joy. Listen when you want to. Listen when it feels good. Listen when it matches what you want to happen. Listen when what you hear makes you feel happy. That wasn't the words. That wasn't what the voice said. Listen to Him. That's pretty clear. You know, I, I, I know folks... 
And I'm one of them on occasion that just doesn't listen. Some rules about, or not rules, but just some pointers on the Word of God. How do we know it's the Word of God? How do I know what I'm hearing is God's Word and not my word or not my thought or not wishful thinking? Well, here's the first rule. This is rule number one when it comes to the Word of God. And we all know people who say, well, I heard from God today. Really, well, what did God tell you? Right? We all know people like that. Rule number one, if it's not biblical, it's not God. That's the first rule. If, if you want to know if what you're hearing is the Word of God, if it's not biblical then it's not God's Word. Now, it could be part of God's Word. It could be half of part of what God's wanting to say, but it's not God's Word. So that's the first. Psalm, um, Psalm 115. God's Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I mean, this is God's Word for us. And that brings us to point two. God's Word, you know, people say, I wish God would speak to me. God has spoken to you, specifically. This is God's Word for you. He's already spoken. Um, has a beautiful Word for you. Actually has lots of words for you. It'd probably take you the rest of your life to hear all that God wants to share to you. And it's just waiting on you to get started listening. Have you begun to listen to God's Word? He's got so much to say. And this Word is a living Word in the sense that it's fresh, it's new, it moves. Even though it was written... And, and pinned so long ago, it still stirs in us today. It's a living word. And another thing to sort of remember about God's word is often God's word can come through the wise counsel of a godly Christian. God does speak through us. Sometimes God speaks through His creation uh, we can get a sense of God's presence at a sunset or a sunrise. Or... But to hear from God, sometimes we hear from God through one of His saints. Are you ready to listen to God? And are you ready and prepared to meet Jesus? The glory that Peter experienced high up on that mountain... Peter, James, and John, is glory they experienced for a moment. And they were so fearful that they experienced the glory face down in the dirt. Well, heaven is not a face down in the dirt posture. And heaven is being in the presence of the glory of God, of Jesus. Are you ready and prepared to be in that glory? To be in that mountaintop moment while in heaven? I mean, this is an amazing thing. Our, the, the song we've picked, I've picked for our closing, and I, and I hope you have a very uh, small print of it in your bulletin. The uh, title is How Beautiful Heaven Is must be. This is an old song. Mrs. Bridgewater wrote this song. And it's pretty obvious what was going through her mind when she penned these words. Let me read to you the first line. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. The truths, these truths in God's word, he hath given, how beautiful heaven must be. Now she's captured almost everything about the transfiguration. 
God's word, God's glory, how beautiful heaven must be. Our journey to heaven begins with a transformation. Our own little personal mountaintop experience with God. Not Jesus' transformation. That one happened. My transformation. Your transformation. Your heart conversion. That's how the journey begins. Can't skip it. Can't ignore it. Can't go around it. Can't avoid it. A heart conversion starts this journey to heaven. Now there's a lot that happens in between, but it begins, the, it all begins the same. We have to lay aside our good intentions, all of our good works, all of our lofty ideas and wonderful agendas. Lay all that aside and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Put our complete trust in Him. That it was Jesus on the cross dying for my sins and being raised again for my new life. This being justified before God. Being glorified before God. Our journey to heaven begins with a heart conversion. Our own transformation. This morning as we sing our closing... I pray that you would begin to use a song like this to move you through Lent. Because without Easter, this song was never written. We don't have it. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. We're free because of Jesus. So let's stand this morning. Now, if you know this song great, we'll need you to help the rest of us get through it. If you don't know the song, it's not that difficult to sing. It's got a nice little rhythm to it. Uh, Patrick's going to help us uh, get through this hymn. But if you would stand this morning for our closing, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be.
receive the benediction. May the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.